Talk a little bit about the latest Heisman odds out from Las Vegas Superbook. And while some of them are on the nose, some of them are worth the chuckle. So we're going to start from the bottom work our way up here. Texas A&M's Kellen Mond and USC's Keaton Slovis are both getting 50 to 1 odds. Which makes sense as USC is just trying to win the conference championship, come out of the division, represent the, the South in the conference championship, the Pac-12. And Kellen Mond is serviceable. Cool. Also played at A&M. And if A&M were able to perhaps win an SEC championship game, you'd look good for that bet, right? Spencer Sanders is getting 40 to 1 odds. Okay. Uh, I don't know if that's good odds or how many times he's probably going to turn the ball over. I kid. I kid. But yeah, that's that's what it is, right? And then at 30 to 1, Miles Brennan, Sam Howell, Adrian Martinez, and Bo Nix. Sam Howell is the only one I would actually take in that bet because of the season that he had last year. Still don't know what to expect from a guy like Miles Brennan. And Adrian Martinez, as I just intuited yesterday or in the last segment, doesn't have his leading receiver returning, right? He gets Wandale Robinson, who had 453 yards last year receiving. That's where he's at. Then at 25 to 1, Ian Book at Notre Dame, Travis Etienne at Clemson, Chuba Hubbard at Oklahoma State, Derek King at Miami, and Kyle Trask at Florida. I don't really like any of those odds for 25 to 1. I just betting on a running back, cool. Betting on a running back at Oklahoma State, probably not because they got to win the Big 12 championship. Betting on Travis Etienne, maybe. But here more now than perhaps two weeks ago because there is no Justin Ross. But there also is a Joseph Nada, so we'll see. And then, finally, singular odds. Jamie Newman gets 16-1. to Yeah, okay, we'll see. Sam Ellinger getting 14-1. to Spencer Rattler get 12 to 1. And then Justin Fields and Trevor Lawrence each getting 4 to 1. Now, these this is funny for me because Spencer Rattler has scored one touchdown and attempted 11 passes in his career at Oklahoma. Okay? Sam Ellinger has passed for 8,870 yards, rushed for 1,526 yards, and accounted for 93 touchdowns. Still not getting as good odds as a redshirt freshman who's attempted 11 passes. To which I say, flex! That is the Lincoln Riley flex right there. That's what that is. Matter of fact, no disrespect to Spencer because Spencer can play. And you got to love a quarterback with the last name Rattler. And if you've seen him toss it and spin it, you understand what it's going to be. But those odds aren't for Spencer Rattler as much as they're for Lincoln Riley. And what Lincoln Riley has been able to do with quarterbacks here in the past, well, really, five years. Because since Shane Carton, he's at Baker Mayfield, Kyler Murray, Jalen Hurts. You know the story, right? Baker Mayfield, number one overall draft pick, Heisman winner. Kyler Murray, number one overall draft pick, Heisman winner. Matter of fact, we got Major League Baseball draft tomorrow at 6 o'clock. And one of the things that I've been looking at is, is any of these dudes going to be a Kyler Murray? No. No, none of these dudes are going to get drafted in, into the uh, the NFL or were drafted in the NFL. Like, it's just not going to happen. And I just, <laughs> Kyler Murray's a mutant, man. And then Jalen Hurts, right? Which I thought was a really good litmus test for how good Riley is as a quarterback coach and how good that offensive system is because he didn't have that much time. He had about eight months and about 30 practices to get command of the team, to get command of the offense, and to understand how he can function in it. And Riley bent the offense, and really himself, to what Jalen Hurts does well. And one of the things that makes Riley such a great coach to me is his ability to hear his players and respond to what they do well and let them do what they do. One of my favorite moments in the Super Bowl this year is Patrick Mahomes talking to Eric Bieniemy, going, can we run this play? And he says, you want to run that play? He's like, yeah, I want to run that play. If we got time, let's run that play. And Bieniemy relays that to Andy Reid. Andy Reid says, if Pat likes it, let's go with it. And that, I feel, is what Spencer Rattler is going to be able to, to get from Riley this year because he's able to get that from Baker. He's able to get that from Kyler. He's able to get that from Jalen. I really enjoy that. I also am not prepared to bet on Spencer Rattler to win the Heisman Trophy. 
okay? Because I wasn't prepared to bet on Baker Mayfield to win the Heisman Trophy in 2015, even after what he had done at Texas Tech. Now, 2016 was a different story altogether, right? Because he's right there. He's, he's right there. And Didi is right there, right? And then all of it came together in 2017. And I think 21 for Rattler is probably going to be the year as it should be because everybody's going to be mature and injuries are injuries. And you can never say that a team is going to be healthy because they won't be. But they're likely to have Jaden Hazelwood back. If they don't get a Theo Howard this year, they could probably get a medical red shirt for him. And then they would be ridiculously experienced and a joy to watch in scale, right? Add to that, they'll be really seasoned at running back with a year of Seth McGowan, with Marcus Major going into year three, right? And then we'll see what happens with TJ Pledger. But it's a really, it's a really fun year, 21. You just got to get through 2020. And getting through 2020 and going 12 and 2 is really going to be difficult. But there have been more difficult things done. And this <laughs> hard pivot to more difficult things done, because I'm having this conversation with, with Mayberry about Eddie Robinson, who is the man for which the National Coach of the Year is named for. So Ed Orgeron won the Eddie Robinson National Coach of the Year Award for being the best coach in America. And I love that because I'm doing this, this deep dive into HBCU football and really just filling in the gaps of what I don't know while also learning things that, that I thought I knew all over again. And one of those things is Eddie Robinson passed away in 2007. Okay, Eddie Robinson retired as the head coach at Grambling in 1997. Eddie Robinson took over as head coach at Grambling in 1941, y'all. 1941. And seeing as Pearl Harbor happened on December 7th, 1941, his tenure at Grambling predates World War II. Yo! Or in World War II in the United States. <laughs> So when we talk about, you know, crossing eras and we talk about what's hard and what's not, the fact that Eddie Robinson coached at one place for 56 years and from 43 to 56 coached football and basketball and managed to win a national championship in the first 10 years he's on the job against Florida A&M in the Orange Blossom Classic, I'm still like the stuff that has happened in college football. The stuff that we think is cool, the stuff that it seems unprecedented, kind of like Riley in three years going 36 and six. The stuff like Riley having back-to-back -back number one overall draft picks at quarterback, being the first university, let alone first coach, to have three consecutive quarterbacks drafted in the first two rounds of the NFL draft. I always am trying to put that stuff into context because it helps the show and it helps you better understand just how weird and awesome college football can be. And then I take a look at HBCUs, which again, plus UV Ferguson, are separate but equal in many ways. We get two different kinds of football for about 70 years. We get HBCU football and we get predominantly white in uh, institution football, right? Also in there, I would add Florida A&M, Grambling, Texas Southern, Kentucky State, Shaw, Bethune Cookman, they all wanted to schedule teams like Florida, Miami, Georgia, Alabama. They wouldn't schedule them. Even as we had coaches that were quote or like were mingling at clinics together. Matter of fact, Florida AM used to put on one of the best coaches' clinics in all the country, and Frank Broyles would go down there. Yeah, that guy, University of Arkansas, right? You get Paul Brown to participate in these. You got Bear Bryant to participate in these. And everybody would trade. They would trade notes. It's the reason why Florida A&M went to their wide single T offense, which is a, a lot like zone blocking, right? But at the time, it was considered to be as gimmicky as the air raid because then Bear Bryant and others would say, no, I'm going to run right through those splits. That's what my guys are going to do. To which, at the time, Jay Gaither's head coach, Florida a and was like, no, the balls are going to be gone before y'all get through the splits. And that's usually what happened. But I'm bringing all that to say – We've even seen things like the transfer portal and one-time transfers happen. Do you realize single platoon, platoon football was an NCAA mandate? Like there's a period of time 
where the NCAA said you could only play both ways. Only play both ways. You could not have an offense and a defensive unit. You could only have both ways. And this is at a time when traditionalists would say, thank God for this because I want individual heroes. I want a great linebacker and a great tailback, and I want him to be one person. But this also was one of the reasons for which schools were able to increase their enrollment because, one, you got to add more players to your football team, and two, with the GI Bill, there were lots of universities and colleges that were clamoring for players. I mean, we have pre-flight schools that gave us Woody Hayes, uh, Jim Tatum and Bud Wilkinson, among others, right? And we have so many great veterans that played football just after World War II. Many of them went to HBCUs. And the reason I'm bringing that up is you can actually draw a direct line between how many people attended the school and whether or not the school needed to go out of business. And then with segregation ending with Brown v. Board of Education, you saw the dismantling of many historically black colleges because what you saw were politicians that would say, hey, look, now now we don't need to. But even in places like Florida, they would use the they would use the horse racing fund to help subsidize the schools, right? Gambling. And even with this subsidy uh, uh the subsidizing where places like Florida AM got 12% of that fund and places like Florida, University of, got 56% of that fund. Florida was still bad at football. Like, I love this. I love that Florida beat Georgia one time in the course of five years following World War II. Like, it's just... <laughs> Florida only got good when all the money started to get directed to them. Till then, Florida was not all that great. And I, I love that. But I also love the wild history of this sport because we're at a time when it's going to be wilder history still. We're at a time when we're going to see schools that have to give up football. We're going to see conference realignment here in a big way, regardless of whether or not the virus occurred. We're going to see maybe games with full stadiums, games with empty stadiums. We're going to see really, really interesting change, but that's also something that we are used to seeing, right? Because I mean, it wasn't that long ago that permissible benefits were a part of how you recruited players. And then the NCAA decided to implement rules to say, hey, you can no longer give guys jobs or pay them or give them cars to recruit them to play college football, which the NCAA schools, right, tried to fight. And then when it looked like a couple of really good football teams were going to be ineligible, they, they let that go, which also demonstrates where we are right now, which is to say that the NCAA doesn't really have a say. If enough universities believe it, then it becomes true. Just like any word, for many of you, the word Karen has become derogatory, somebody's name, like Becky a few years ago, right? But that's all because there's been a wide agreement that that word can be used as a derogatory term, right? That's more or less how college football has operated since it's dawn. If enough people agree that it is so, then it is so. Like a national championship. You know, even in historically black colleges, you would have two different or three different, in some cases, papers that were recognized as champions, right? Chicago Defender, Pittsburgh Courier, and the Atlanta Daily, right? And I found those to be really interesting because there were games that, acted as de facto national championship games like the Orange Blossom Classic. And then there was the National Classic, which I believe was like the MEAC and the CIAA. But all this stuff is is coming back around because it's always been the way that we do things. And I need that to be comforting. Right? The idea of a Spencer Rattler winning a Heisman Trophy, while I don't think it's going to happen, is no longer unprecedented. We've seen redshirt freshmen do it before. Johnny Manziel, Hello. I do, I believe Tim Pebo did this as well. And that's just, you know, this decade. So in these differences and in these political times, if you will, one of the things that I've been looking at is the history to see how, how, if if any way, have we been able to, to combat these sorts of things in the past? And how good were the solutions that we came up with in the past? Do they need to be tweaked?
right? Which is one of the reasons that I decided to do the monologue about Clemson this morning is because I think we need to differentiate what works and what does not work. <laughs> Where we are in society, what we agree on, what we believe, as opposed to what we don't. And especially in college football right now, as I've been really entertained and warm and fuzzy about how collegial the athletic directors have been in all of this. And how the conference commissioners are, are not actually at each other's throat, they're just voicing concerns. <laughs> Which is what we need to do. We need to be asking more questions than we're trying to offer solutions. Which is the point of quote-unquote listening sessions. All right.